And that's what more people are dying of. So somehow that needs to be addressed between the police and public health. And uh, yeah. the dealers, if they people die of it, they need to be stricter on that. Because that fentanyl seems to be making people more people die. It is, yeah. We had out in the park district a month ago or so, the two people, I think they found, I think it was fentanyl overdose. It, it takes like almost nothing to kill you. It's so powerful. Uh, yeah. Is it is this, op is this opiate problem citywide issue or is, it, or is it contained in a certain area mostly? I would say it'd be mostly in this downtown area, but it's, so it's, it's, it's yeah. everywhere. I mean, I mean, but it, when kids would come down up from up there to get it, maybe. But I mean, right here, it, it's, it's, most it's concentrated here. in the downtown most area. Here. Well, what, you, what you hear is down here. You don't hear what's going on on Knob Hill because they're doing it quietly behind their door. Exactly. Um, here down it's on here, the street. Down here, we're doing, you're doing it right out in front of everybody. Yeah, but if they... We get the attention. If they overdose and die in their nice places, it may, they may, uh, it may be a while before anybody gets to their bodies. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's really yeah. scary what... It was going on. And, um, I see, and I oh. have been worked off with the Department of uh, Station uh, when this was Central District mm -hmm. under Catherine Gray back in the 80s. Um, uh, the uh, drug epidemic is absolutely insane. And um, City of Hall's uh, idea that, well, if we keep it down in the Tenderloin, nobody will notice. <laughs> Um, the 20,000 people in the tunnel I notice every day. Um, and um, so I think that anything that we as citizens can do to help the department, um, we should try and do. I, don't. I think what it is is that civil libertarians who are often progressives but sometimes conservative, they demand a certain level of civil rights for everyone. And when people are not responsible with those civil liberties, the problem is why nothing is named for They abuse it abuse. Yeah. Yes, sir. Software engineers use the term, if it's not a, it may not be a bug, it might be a feature. I mean, how else are you going to depopulate uh, the, 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 you know, depopulate the people, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, when yeah. you don't have jobs for them? Any other questions for us, Harvey? Yes. Just a comment I want to say. I appreciate you wearing your CIT. I, I was just in your class. CIT. But I'm one of the, the trainers. So yeah. Oh. I appreciate uh, yeah. seeing that. And not all officers. I was just at the last one last week. Yes. Right. Uh, What's the CIT stand for? Uh, crisis intervention training. Okay. Yeah. Or team. Or team, yeah. You were really a lot of help, thanks for you was coming down here and talking with Oh, yeah, no, I, I enjoyed coming and talking were, with everyone. Were you over here a few years ago when the guy took the temple off the top of the Ritz? Uh, the next door right here? No. Oh, that's <laughs> all there was a day long. It went for days. The guy was screaming his head off. Yeah. So it was, uh, they eventually talked about yeah. yeah. pizza and a cat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whatever it takes, right? <laughs> yeah. there's, there's never a hurry in that. So, any other questions or any comments? Or I just want to say that you know we're we're, we're definitely trying our best as a police department. It's you know it's, it's a tough it's a tough job sometimes, but you know we do care about the community and, and you know we, we really do our do. I'm a member can. of Access of Love, and for for over a decade we've been giving out free cannabis to people, poor people, and patients who are sick folks and people with opioid addictions, alcohol addictions, and it works. Yeah. It's very well. It's a very good diversion. Uh, you know, you have to. Some people you have to really talk them into it. Uh, almost all cannabis will mimic a drug high without the, the, the ill effects, and it'll even reverse some of the effects of uh, ill effects of alcohol and tobacco. You know, so um, it's just something to think about. You know, because oh, yeah. we, Tom Amiano had uh, we we had a, a committee, and it was called the lowest priority enforcement committee. It's, we used to meet once a month at City Hall. And we uh, we had uh, Tom Amiano had a uh, a resolution to make cannabis the lowest in, uh, enforcement priority so, uh, so over ten years. Yeah, I can say that we, we there's I mean it's 
it's legal to possess, and, you know, but it, it is it is not legal to smoke out on the street in public. Um, but, you know, we don't really enforce that much. Um, yeah. uh, the, the only thing that, that we don't enforce very much, but we do a little bit, is is the illegal weed, weed sales on the street because. They're not selling it just to adults. They're out there, and they'll always have a business because they're selling it to the minors. Oh. And uh, that's that's a problem that I have with that. I mean, you know, I know marijuana is legal, and I have no issues with it. Uh, but you know, selling it to the uh, high school kids or younger, yeah. you know, that, that. Yeah, they actually added more penalties with Prop 64. Added more penalties. Oh, okay. It doesn't have the state strikes law. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, we, we're not really enforcing any kind of marijuana yeah, yeah, very much. So, yeah, because uh, homeless people have nowhere to smoke it. Yeah. You know? yeah. Any other questions for the sergeant? Um, you weren't here when I made the announcement. Commander Lazar is coming next month. Right? Oh, I did hear that. Yeah, oh, okay. he's a great man. I've worked for him a couple times. He's, he's a very good speaker. Um, and uh, so he's going to pass it on to the captain. Yep. Um, that uh, he's coming for the week. I keep inviting the captain to come. And introduce himself to the to the neighborhood. He'll come down. And he keeps having issues. Yeah. Well, sometimes he uh, has meetings or you know gets a little bit late. For him. <laughs> but, uh, um, I'll give him an update on the meeting. And okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. I want to I want to thank our oh. local business owner from Dallas for coming. Yes. Thank you. Curtis, you're up. Yeah, hi guys. Uh-huh, okay. So, uh, I got these, I won't give y'all passes around. Yeah. It's not gonna be much help, but let me have one just one copy so I can refer to that. It's not gonna be that much help, but. Oh, you left your coat. I'm not a fool. Bye, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So, my name is Curtis Bradford. Uh, other than serving on this board, um, I'm also the co-chair of the Tenderloin People's Congress. This is why I'm here to talk to you. Uh, the Tenderloin People's Congress is a collection of resident organizations and individuals from the t residents from the Tenderloin. Um, I think right now we have like 12 resident organizations uh, that are part of the coalition. Um, so, and we, you know, we meet monthly, and we've been around for about two years now, two, maybe three, or, you know, I guess two years. Uh, some of you might remember a big block party we had on Jones Street. That was sort of our, our launching. And uh, so we work on issues that, uh, whatever comes up in the neighborhood around development, around housing, with anti-eviction. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on is the uh, anti-eviction campaign that we've been working against Mr. Mosser, the guy from the rent control board, who uh, we have managed to embarrass and, and, and sort of um, bring out into the open, which resulted in that lovely article in the newspaper, the examiner last month, and it ended up being a, a, an issue that was raised at the planning commission where he was further humiliated. So I, I'm, I, I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm bringing that up because I'm getting whatever publicity I can get on that, I want to get on that, because uh, I want to keep calling him out everywhere we can, because uh, he is not a, a uh, good lady. Um, but that's not the reason I'm here tonight. The reason I'm here tonight is to talk to you about another project that we're working on, which is called uh, the Tenderloin uh, Vision 2020 and Beyond. Uh, so this is a resident-driven process uh, that we are trying to create a neighborhood tenderloin platform basically a platform that kind of spells out what Tenderloin residents uh, have indicated that they want some real solution, like solutions to some of the problems. We all know what the problems are, so we weren't, we weren't really talking, spending much time talking about that. We were really trying to look for ideas, solutions, and really just get as much input as we can. So to that end, we have been out to uh, nearly 50 buildings now. We've gone in and, and done meetings like this in, in nearly 50 buildings, meeting with residents, we also held the Tenderloin People Summit a couple of weeks ago, which uh, brought in a couple of hundred more people. So we've talked to over 800 residents already um, about uh, issues in the neighborhood and really just trying to look for what their ideas were and their thoughts were. So, and when we've gone to do the outreach, we've, we started with this along, and it also included, you know, it came with a little s small survey that came with it. 
when you read through here, there's, there's some really basic stuff in here, okay? But it does highlight the six main areas that, that we, uh, you know, that we raised, the six categories, right? So you can reference that from this sheet. But this was meant to be sort of a conversation starter. So this doesn't really have the content of what we were talking about. This was just to start the conversation. The, the, the important stuff was what we heard back from people, right? So this was just to kind of initiate the conversation so that we could collect ideas. And that's why we talked to all these residents. Um, but this is a good little place to start the conversation, right? And that's what I shared with you guys today. Uh, so that's where we're at in the stage. We just had the People Summit uh, last week. Um, they're still compiling all of the data from uh, all of the outreach meetings, the notes from the outreach meetings, the surveys, as well as the, all the information that we got from the summit. And hopefully in the next week or so, we're gonna have a sort of a, a summary of what all of that information looked like. Uh, then we'll go into a phase of trying to craft a draft sort of neighborhood platform out of all of that, right? Uh, then from there we go into the second phase, which is going to be the stakeholder phase. So after we've gone to the residents, we've gathered all this information uh, because we really wanted it to be a resident-driven process, um, then we're going to go into the stakeholder phase where we take what the residents have said they wanted and what they've identified as, as solutions and uh, start presenting it to property owners, business, business owners, landlords, uh, service providers, you know, folks of that kind, right? And so that we can show them what, what we've come up with, what the residents have come up with as solutions, and, and hear back from all of the other stakeholders about their thoughts, their input, their opinions. Where do we have some overlap? Where do we have conflict? But uh, ultimately to try and create something that um, we can get as wide of a, coalition as possible, you know, where we can get as much of the neighborhood as we can, asking for the same thing, saying the same thing, speaking with one voice, because that will really amplify the impact of the work that we're trying to do. Uh, so we'll have this platform, we'll be able to use it in the election cycle to present to our candidates, to really sort of grow them like, you know, and find out where they stand on these issues and these positions and what they will support, um, and try to get them on public record for that. Uh, and hold them accountable for it. Uh, also, we can use it to take the service providers and say, service providers, you know, this is what the residents and the people in the neighborhood are asking for. This is what they've identified as the needs and the missing things in the neighborhood, rather than folks from the outside looking at us and saying, well, this is what you need in the neighborhood, right? Uh, and, and while I don't expect it to fully change all of their programs and their services, I think it might help guide them in the future and. and, and identifying areas where maybe their services are lacking or where there are holes or where they're providing the service that's not even really needed. Uh, that's step one. And so that's, even that is an ambitious goal, right? To get to this stage and create this platform that the neighborhood can get behind and we can use for leverage in the city and stuff in the budgeting cycle, et cetera. But there's a longer term goal to this. There's, a, there's, there's a, something on the other end, which is after we've created this platform and we've got the neighborhood sort of unified behind it, it's really meant to be sort of a, a, a launching platform for the next phase, which will be uh, updating the Tenderloin 2000 plan. So creating a Tenderloin area plan to put into the planning code, which will help guide planning and, and sort of the, the development. It, you know, it informs planning, it informs the MTC, it's the city services. Um, they all, you will use, use that as a sort of a guidepost for, for the decisions, and it can actually set laws and requirements, you know, zoning laws and stuff like that. So the idea is to, re, to write a new or updated Tenderloin plan, Vision 2020, Tenderloin Vision 2020, and beyond, because we've learned from the past that uh, once you create this plan, it takes a few years to get it done, so we're, we're talking a couple of years to even get it, get the process finished, uh, and get it, you know, with pressure, get it put into the planning code. Um, and once it's there, it will probably guide the, 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 the future of the neighborhood for the next 20, 30 years. So we're really trying to envision what do we want to see our neighborhood look like 20 to 30 years from now. And I'm, I'm sure most of us agree that we want it to remain a, uh, a neighborhood for low-income folks, for immigrant folks, for seniors and disabled, where but we can still all live here and live comfortably. We're trying to make sure people get to stay in their homes. But we also want it to be a healthy community and a vibrant community, and we want our fair share of resources and stuff. So uh, it's trying to address the problems and, and prevent displacement. Um, 
and, and make sure that just like the Tenderloin 2000 plan, which helped guarantee that the Tenderloin would be here today, uh, the idea is to actually make sure that this plan help, helps ensure that the Tenderloin will still be the Tenderloin 20, 30 years from now. So that's where we're at. And I'll take any questions. Okay, I was around 20 years ago, you know, and I was at Lower Eighth Street Leavenworth Task Force. We had this wonderful idea for an economic engine that would provide employment and uh, a few other things, you know, and, and, it, and the people would, who live here would be able to work at that, you know, get, get jobs. It was going to be like a parking garage, possibly opposite the Hilton or something, and, you know, we had these ideas of, uh, you know, well, what happened was the Hilton and Wells Fargo snatched it away. Uh, you know, basically they said, we're going to, you know, uh, and then, uh, then it got snatched away from them or whatever, or maybe they just let it go to something else, which uh, it wasn't a bad thing, but it wasn't what we wanted. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that what happened was bad, but I mean, there was more pro things built and everything, a lot more, you know, play uh, but it's, and some of that is coming into fruition now with more housing being built here. But we wanted something that, that could employ people, you know, they, that, uh, uh, so that, because, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, people on fixed income need a little extra. And, you know, young families need, you know, need to not have to run, run all over town to, to three different jobs. You got something in here. Right? Well, Laura, will you do me a favor? Laura, will you do me a favor? Will you do like you've done in some of the other outreach meetings and just sort of keep notes about what we hear? Because relying on my memory is probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, and I want to make sure that we get some sort of record of what, what these folks say. I'm planning that uh, Susan's talking about ran into the development of the property owners got wind of the idea and uh, the property value that they wanted for that, the money they wanted for their property quadrupled. Hmm. And it just it outpriced uh, what the funds were available. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then the Hilton pulled out of it and um, uh, the project died. We've seen that happen in a couple of the other things that we've tried to do too. Somebody gets it's wind a, of That's it. a nutshell. That's yeah. for, uh, you're Somebody gets about wind that you're trying to looking at a piece of property and all of a sudden the price is triple what it you're was. talking about the pavilion, right? Yeah. yeah. So another big part of Whitefield was that they had to have the mayor, the city had to have one representative on the governing board and Willie Brown decided he was going to pick the person and it actually was somebody from Glide. Somebody mm -hmm. from Glide. And that caused the demands on what the what the cash flow from the project was going to be to to uh, uh, you know become unrealistic. And basically, what the neighborhood was hoping. This is no disrespect to Glide. What the neighborhood was hoping for all these nonprofits, they were hoping for an income stream, you know, outside of Glide. When Glide piled on top, it, it got on. So I, I'm not sure if I understand what the project was. You'll have, maybe I can get with you and you can, it's you all can explain it's more. It's the building. Got it to me, which you're talking about right yeah. here, Eddie and Taylor, right? Yeah. Because Don Falk mentioned something to me about it, and I really didn't get me. It was so, like talking about it being a, a pavilion or convention center? Or yes. So for years and years, the neighborhood tried to keep hotels from being built. Right. That's the whole defense of the neighborhood. Sure. In the 1980s and early, not early 90s, I guess, they came up with this idea, well, maybe we could own a hotel and we could use the revenue, you know, for all kinds of good things. Okay. And that's what it was. I get it, I get it. Well, Economic well, engine, that's yes. what we had in mind, yeah. And now, any other comments or questions? So I, I did want to say, um, this is an ongoing process. So we're just, we really just finished the first stage of outreach. There's a lot more to do. Um, but if you're interested in helping or getting involved or participating, uh, we meet the, the committee that the, the, the Tenderloin People's Congress meets the first Monday of every month at, bye Bill, thanks for coming. The Tenderloin People's Congress meets the first Monday of every month at 11 o'clock at Bodecker Park Community Center. So you're, anybody's welcome to come to that. When? Um, Bodecker Park Community Center. Okay. 11 a.m. first, first Monday. Monday of every month. Mm -hmm.
11 a.m. first Monday of every month. Uh, but the committee that's actually responsible for the Tenderloin Vision 2020 that's really doing, and you know, committee is where all the work actually gets done. Decisions get made.